The F and Rad Snowboard Podcast is presented by Vans. Season 8 of F and Rad is sponsored by Wired Snowboards and on Optics, the Boardroom Snowboard Shop, Find an Epic Agent Worldwide Real Estate, and Tribute Board Shop in Nelson, BC. Wired Snowboards is a Vancouver-based manufacturer and distributor of quality snowboards that just happens to be less than 10 minutes from my house. I spent today there building a custom board for myself. Well, Pepe was building it and I was kind of helping. The board's a beauty with custom-drawn art by the great Kaz Nahui. And the board is a Vantage 154, which I'm a little bit big for, I know, but the wide shovel and the taper profile will allow me to stay nimble in the North Shore's tight trees with lots of float in the nose. I couldn't be more excited. You can go to wiredsnowboards.com and design your own custom snowboard or choose from their many in-stock shapes. I promise you'll be stoked. Support also comes from Dekine, Mount Seymour, Grouse Mountain, Pro Standard GoPro Accessories, and Volcom Outerwear. Guys, if you can manage a little liking and following, maybe ask a friend or two to do it as well. It would really help people find the show. Thanks. Special thanks this episode to Beneath Apparel, This Place is Awesome Vacation Rentals in Whistler, GlitterGirlsStudios.com, BoardingForBreastCancer.com, and Tomahawk Indigenous Products. Tina Bassich is a fan favorite, a legend, a pioneer, and a true snowboarder at heart. She consistently progressed women's competitive snowboarding from the early days until she retired from pro snowboarding in 2000. Think about it. In Tina's over 12-year career as a pro, she legitimately rode Sorrells, toured with the Kemper team, was one of the first pros to move to Utah to dedicate her life to snowboarding, designed some of the first women's specific snowboarding gear, had one of the very first women's pro models, and she's a founding member of Boarding for Breast Cancer. Plus, she did the first 720 in a women's big air competition at the X Games in 1998. It seems impossible, but it's true. She wrote a book called Pretty Good for a Girl, and she continues to be an ambassador for women's snowboarding and a true icon. I'm super stoked to bring you this home studio interview with Tina Bassich. Yeah. I moved here 20 years ago and um, wanted to be, I lived in Utah for the 90s and right. then wanted to come back to Sacramento where my hometown was, but not live in Sacramento. And I didn't quite want to live in the snowboarding scene. I kind of needed a rest. And so this was right out of the snow line. And yeah. I wanted to be in like an artsy kind of, small town life so this is out of the snow line you're not shoveling your driveway not shoveling the driveway or scraping the ice off the windshield <laughs> how far are you from uh you know like where you're gonna go ride tomorrow? um tomorrow i'm gonna go ride at sugar bowl and it's about 45 minutes that's it it's 45 minutes to sugar yeah. bowl from here so it's pretty good i think tahoe is it's got to be one of the best places to live if you're a professional snowboarder yeah it's it's hard to say depends on what time of life you're choosing that. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> in my younger life, when I had energy to to dig out my car out of the snow and do crazy stuff, you know, be in the scene to completely submerge in the scene, yeah. any ski town would have done well for me as long as they allowed snowboarding on the mountain. Yeah, because you're traveling a lot, yeah. right? Yeah. You Okay, so you hit the ground running... Like basically, you. I, I think you started snowboarding around eighty five. Is that about right? Yeah, I started snowboarding in nineteen eighty five. I was in high school, oh, and wow. so I hung out with all the skateboarders and kind of the artistic crowd in high school. And so, my mom discovered a snowboard at a sports store, and so that was kind of our first even vision of what a snowboard was. And she knew we would like it. And I knew I would like it because I was going to be landing on snow instead of concrete, like yeah. skateboarding. Yes. So um, we gave it a try. My brother and I started the same day in 1985. I believe it was the winter of 84, 85 or 85, 86. Yeah. It's been a while. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I instantly was attracted to it. It was a thrill flying down the hill. It was different than sledding because you could absorb and try and turn, but 
remember back then my board had three fins like a surfboard <laughs> yeah it had no metal edges the high i did have high backs they were like felt like they were two feet tall and hit the back of my knees <laughs> and i had little like almost like seat belt look clips for yeah. uh like luggage tech. clips yeah the fast tech buckles people yeah. talk about those breaking and they, do, they yeah they i still have that board and it's <gasps> Wow. completely shattered the bindings just crumbled is it here yeah, yeah. at dave sioni's last night he pulled out his old trick stick you know the yellow oh and black gosh. zebra kind of yeah it's such an iconic board yeah. would you uh, this is what i was thinking on the way up like for women snowboarding the field was smaller there were less but i mean there was still a lot yeah, we. But you were the you were the top dog for. <laughs> Thank you. For a, Thank for you. a really long time. Well, it felt like the scene was small, um, but at that time, like that was the only scene I thought existed, because right. we were in our bubble at Donner Ski Ranch with, you know, a good twelve to fifteen riders that would come up on weekends after school and. And make it there. And it was like Dave Sioni and Tucker Franson, Mike Jacoby, Chris and Monty Roach, um, my friend Heather Mills. And then it was also Damian Sanders and Sean Palmer would show up every once in a while. Oh and Mike God. Chantry and Don Bostick and all of those people from back then. And my brother, of course. And so Heather Mills was uh, my best friend at high school. And so oh, she wow. started with me there. Um, so I did start riding with a peer that was female, you know, but yeah. all the guys were there. And then there was a small handful of local girls that, uh, hopped on the scene. And so, um, when I did my first contest at Donner ski ranch, there was four women entered. So <laughs> it was pretty good chances to podium. And I won a hoodie and a skateboard, Amazing. Uh, for third place or something, you, you know, like. That's incredible. We were so, so pumped on free stuff. Like back then, free stuff was the sponsorship. Absolutely. It didn't even enter my mind that somebody was going to pay for my gas to get to the what ski are you, resort. <laughs> what are you riding in this first contest? Are you still riding that Burton board? Obviously. I was riding that Burton board in wow. the first contest. Wow. Um, and I always remember what kind of surf style we had. Yeah. And I realized that that was just because we were trying to balance on those type of boards. Like you weren't <laughs> holding an edge. You were really holding your hands out and patting the dog and all yeah, those yeah. things came up because of how the equipment was. And the second that the equipment started evolving, my next board was given to me by Tom Sims out wow. at the um, 87 World Championships in Breckenridge. And Mike Chantry had hooked it up that I was going to... I was this girl that was pretty good that was coming out that we should flow a board to. So, so, sick. Um, so Tom gave me that board and I entered that giant solemn in the half pipe there. And that half pipe was way bigger than what I was used to at Donner Ski Ranch. So Donner Ski Ranch was like three foot walls. <laughs> yeah. And then the 87 Worlds was maybe like eight foot walls. Yeah. So it was a big jump up and um what i was riding down and so this new board kind of had a little more control um so i got the hang of it pretty quickly but what what board was it was it, it like was a, the pocket knife the pocket knife sims pocket yeah, knife yeah and that was a big deal to go out to colorado as a junior in high school and a junior or senior in high school and see the scene for the first time outside of the Donner Ski Ranch bubble. Yeah. And that's when I really realized that snowboarding was bigger than our little Tahoe scene. That's, so that's it a was cool... a big eye opener. Yeah. And then yeah. also it exposed me to, like I got six and a half pipe, even though I fell. So I did, you know, double handed grasser type trick and a couple tricks before I fell. So I got some points and got sixth place and, um, George Pappas was there and he was ripping and he said, Hey, um, there's this new, uh, company starting. Would you like to be a part of it? And it was Kemper snowboards. And so a lot wow. of people kind of got picked up on the team at that contest. And then that kind of gave me the leverage to get more places and 
be more exposed by magazines and things like that. Yeah, it was kind of an instant travel budget, right? Like they would pay for you guys to yeah. go to the contest wherever. Yeah, we went um, right away. I mean, that contest must have been in March or something. And right away that summer, we went up to Black Home and had the team photo shoot. So yeah. within two months, I was head to toe day glow <laughs> with my snowboard, my little mini Kemper snowboard. Luckily they made a small one. Yeah. And, um, and it was like Jeff Curtis and Joe Curtis and Dave Dowd and Shannon Mel Hughes and Andy Hetzel and Brett Johnson and <laughs> Adam Merriman and like all oh, those wow. awesome, the original Kemper crew was pretty fun. That seems, yeah. I mean, those images are burned into my, into yeah. my brain. Was it, Bud Fawcett that was shooting those, or that might. I don't been remember. Yeah. I don't think it was Bud. Okay, it might have been somebody up in Canada. Canada. Yeah, sure. I don't remember. Yeah, but what were like? What was that trip? Like, what were your responsibilities? Was it like get up in the morning? We, I don't go remember shoot? the details of the trip, but I remember um, the snow was summer snow, so it was kind of dirty, and but we were trying <laughs> yeah. to get like photos of the clothing and the base and the. Lots of cruising through town and <laughs> posing like we're walking across the street and yeah. stuff like that. And, yeah. But it felt exciting and it was new. And uh, the fact that I was on a snowboard team and now I was calling myself a professional snowboard snowboarder <laughs> was like the best. No doubt. Yeah. So Kemper goes to Sims. You go back on to Sims from Kemper? Well, the Kemper days represent when snowboarding exploded for me and popularity because back in the Donner days, you know, we weren't allowed at ski resorts. The skiers were gurning us all the time. We'd meet up at the bottom of the lift to ride up together so that we wouldn't have to answer any more questions about <laughs> what is that and why do they let you on the lift? Yeah. Um, so when Kemper team started, those guys really had my back. They were so supportive of me as a rider, as a female, as a woman, as a, um, fellow teammate and athlete, like we were really starting to build something and snowboarding was finally starting to become a sport. Yeah. It was popping up everywhere. We were getting onto more resorts, which was like opening a whole new playground to us. We were getting uh, expenses paid for. They were flying us to places for contests. And so, and I was making enough money to where I could just focus and had graduated high school by then. So that was a big deal back then to be able to do that. We even had a Kemper van, like a team van <laughs> oh, wow. that we would drive down the road and like Andy and Maddie Goodman would jump out into the snowbank while going 50 miles an hour, you know, like <laughs> just crazy stuff. I think that van actually ended up in a ditch, <laughs> maybe at the U.S. Open and that's it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it <died. laughs> wow. Yeah, the Kemper was team like, was absolutely infamous. Yeah, and, and they all the guys on the team were just charging it. And so that even helped me charge it because I was not just left on my own and my own ability. Like I had to step up and keep up with the photo crew and the film crew. And, you know, to not ride by myself, I had to keep up with them because there weren't that many women snowboarders out there to join, join in with. So, and that was a time where there was kind of a, token girl on each team. Right. Um, so it was nice when that changed and women were actually able to hold their own on a team and be valued as a team member, not just a token girl. Yeah. You were there for that. Like yeah. I remember prom launching, like, and I remember actually as a, as a guy who worked in a shop that the fastest growing segment of snowboarding was women's. Yeah. Because women had been riding just small men's stuff yeah. for, you know, the first 10 years of snowboarding. Yeah. There was kind of a shift where the, there was enough women riders to alert the industry that we were there, Yeah, but there wasn't support of the equipment yet. And people like Lisa Hudson, who worked at Airwalk and then went on to help us start prom clothing and yeah. people like Gaylene Nagel, who was the uh, marketing and uh, team at Sims, those two women especially stand out as the industry 
And they went to their companies that they work for and said, Hey, we have to do this. We have to do this. And they got a lot of feedback. Like it's not a big enough piece of the pie. It's not going to sell, but they pushed and pushed until we made it happen. And sure enough, splashing the industry with pink prom clothing and ads of Shannon and I dressed in prom dresses, which, yeah. you know, we were tomboys, like we would never be in a prom dress. Right. And then the opposite photo of is, is us jumping off a cliff. Yeah. It was startling enough to get some attention. And then it actually sold, which then pushed it forward. And then it kind of gave, um, like then it, then it made it look like if you weren't doing women's stuff, you were missing out. Totally. So then all the companies kind of started to give it a piece of the pie and a piece of the marketing and a piece of the production and, you know, shelf space for it. And it really changed the sport because I was riding a board that was too big for me. It was too heavy. I was wearing clothes that I'd have to sew on my sewing machine because it was the big pants, big stance era, of, you know, kind yeah. of early 94, 93, 94, 95. And so having equipment that fit us, once we started on those lighter boards, narrower boards, clothing that fit, we felt so much more comfortable on the snow that we could progress our riding that much more. So it really comes back to those people that helped us push it through the industry and gave it a chance and the shop owners and everybody that bought into it to give it a chance. And it kind of rippled out to actually you couldn't, being a movement. Yeah, you couldn't not. Like, yeah. I think our best selling boot, you know, single selling boot, the the year before was like the Airwalk free ride. And then the Circe vans came out. Mm -hmm. And it was like, we, just think of how much untapped market you have there. You've yeah. got women who've been snowboarding for years yeah. that haven't been able to get a boot that fits their feet. Yeah. For, so like... You don't just get like a little bit of that women's market share, like you the get prom the whole stuff. Market. You get the whole thing, <laughs> and then you're like, yeah. going, "All right, like we yeah. doubled our, not just doubled our sales, like we we created an entire thing out of nothing." Yeah. yeah, and it was yeah, it was it was the buzz for, I don't know, what a weird time, masculine, feminine, like men driven companies saying like, "Oh, girls don't need their own stuff." Like, what a weird. It's interesting Oversight. because um, I looked back on a lot of sports history mm -hmm. about women in sports, and I was part of a exhibit at the Smithsonian called Game Face, Brad. and it was photographs of women in their moments in sports, and it went all the way back to like women playing basketball with hoop skirts on, like or whatever, yes. like yeah, up to the seventies where women were not allowed in marathons and th things like that. So when I look back, I recognize like what a big moment that was for us to say, like, we're going to push forward with this. Or when we were told like no women allowed on the jump, we were like, well, watch us, you know, I'm going to prove them wrong. It was more like we wanted to show them up yeah. than it felt like they didn't think we had the ability, not that we were women and we weren't, worth anything. Right. So it felt like we just had to prove ourselves. So it was an interesting time. And now I look back and think like, whoa, we really shifted the place for women in snowboarding. It could have taken many more years to shift if those women hadn't been there to do that. So it's, it was an important time. I think one of the most important yeah. for sure, because snowboarding's always kind of patted itself on the back for being inclusive. But when you look at it, it's not like you look at the company owners, you look at the, just look at the brochures for the, for the products that are out there. Mm -hmm. There's very little diversity. Yeah. There's, you know, and women's snowboarding didn't really, and, and probably still doesn't get the support that, you know, proportionate to how many consumers out there are women. Like it's got to mm -hmm. be pretty close to 50, 50 at the huh. consumer level. Yeah, it always blows my mind to, um, like, I just took my daughter up to go to her snowboarding practice for her snowboarding team from her high school. Right. What is happening? <laughs> yes. Like, I wouldn't imagine that when I started. Like, right. there was no high school snowboarding teams. There was no parks. 
to practice in. There was barely any ski resorts to let us on. There was no snowboard shops. There was like, so now when I see schools and, <laughs> you know, um, nonprofits that get kids out to, on the mountain for the good of their soul, like yeah. to let them thrive. And I am just so grateful that, um, snowboarding brings that. Cause I felt the love for snowboarding instantly. And I think everybody that snowboards can say that that is a true thing. Like there was a reason why everybody quit their day job <laughs> so that they could snowboard yeah. and wash dishes every night so they totally. could ride every day. Like there's something special about it. And so the fact that so many people, including women and little girls and everybody's enjoying it is such a positive thing. And I don't totally look at the stats of like what's happening with women. And, you know, like I'm just grateful that it's all available for all ages yeah. and all people and families are riding together. And it's just a really positive Snowboarding is a such a positive feeling. Yeah. I mean, I came into it through the surf vibe. Like when I was a kid, I was like, I need to surf. Yeah. But there's no surf in Ontario, Canada. Yeah, yeah. And even coming out to the coast of British Columbia, you still need to go another five hours to get to the surf. So, you know, skateboarding kind of started to feel that. And then snowboarding right away. You yeah. could see that the lifestyle, you'd see somebody, you know, try snowboarding and then, yeah, go off the yeah. rails. They're like, I'm moving to Whistler. I'm living in a closet under somebody's stairs. I'm getting the night job so I can snowboard all day. Yeah. And I'm not just talking about pros. Like there was an entire community of people that were just completely dropped out of of regular society to snowboard. Yeah. It was And amazing. I remember times where... We slept in the back of the truck because we got there early and our hotel didn't start till the next day for the yeah. team. And um, we roughed it back then just to get to where we could get to the contest or get to the good snow. And so I have such an appreciation of gratitude for being able to snowboard still today yeah. and through my career that I got so many years of doing what I loved completely, full-heartedly given that chance to, to do that, that I just, um, I'm nothing but grateful for that. And it's hard to watch, um, teams or kids that expect that they want more or deserve more when, when you haven't gone through that. So it's, yeah. it sometimes bothers me if I hear stories, like I was doing some reporting for NBC towards the end of my career in the early two thousands. And, and so I would, interact with the snowboarders of that time yeah. and some of them wouldn't give me the time of day to do an interview and you know they were really focused on their art and their run and winning and stuff but I really made me realize that when I snowboarded I would do every interview I would do anything I could to expose myself so that I could keep being sponsored yeah. and get after it and so I hope that the kids of today that are sponsored and getting a full ride that they recognize what a gift that is. Yeah. There was definitely a vibe of like, like you said, like if you're riding on the chairlift with four snowboarders, you don't have to do the thing. Like when you ride with a skier, you have to explain the whole thing to them. Yeah. They were just so curious. Everyone in the world was kind of looking at this thing. And then Jamie Salter takes ride public. And it was like international financial news. They were like, yeah snowboarding you can be rich if you invest in <laughs> snowboarding it was like it just went so crazy yeah one of the things that i love about your career is that the progression happens at these contests so you're riding yeah. donner you go to breck and now all of a sudden you have to learn how to ride this thing at the contest in practice. Yeah. And, and th that was that happened all the way through, right? That was the fact for most of my competing career because um we would they would improve like then they inv they invented the pipe dragon. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we were like we kind of had a consistency from contest to contest in Colorado cuz they were using the pipe dragon. And then but when you would go back home there wouldn't be a half pipe to practice in. So oh, we were always like 
you had to get to practice on time because you had an hour to figure out your run and maybe learn two new tricks Oh wow! because you heard so-and-so was doing whatever. Right. And so you wanted to show up and get it done. And so a lot of the, it, I mean, that's completely different than what today, like oh, yeah. people train, they figure out their run in the half pipe and they are critiqued and videoed and coached and trampolines everything into foam pits everything and it's planned yeah. and they're not going to be at the top of the pipe going ah, i'm not feeling that layback slide <laughs> on the third hit i'm going to do it on the fifth hit and then i'm going to go for the alley-oop on the second hit yeah it is not like that anymore and for us like i remember being at the um u.s open in vermont and i had my run and i was feeling real confident and then the whole guys division went first and they completely chewed up part oh, of the wall where right. I was planning on some vert to do, to get enough kick to do a 540, right? which was my hardest trick at the time. Yeah. And so by the time the women ran, that wall was gone. And so I had to switch it up, you know, so we always had to make shift the highway hit would get too played out and then yeah. we'd have to hit the other side first. And so nothing was planned as much as it is today. Not e no training in the gym, the, no coaches, no uniforms, no. Yeah, you had it to was keep, different. You had to keep up with the partying. From what <laughs> I've understood, it was like if you really wanted to be a champion, like Craig was great. Everybody loved Craig. Everybody um, respected him. But like the guys like Kearns and Johnson, who would party harder than anybody and still get up and go and get, you know, sometimes yeah. Johnson would win the contest. <laughs> He'd be up all night. I don't know how he did that. Nobody knows yeah. how he did it. I really uh, wasn't a partier, so right. I took it seriously. Yeah. Like, I appreciated what I was offered and really took it seriously. I didn't... I was at the parties, but I wasn't in the ditch after the party. <laughs> I was driving everybody home right. and making sure I was up and at the pipe because I wasn't going to miss a minute of practice because half my team was in the ditch. Right. I, right. They, you know... It wasn't like that. So I really, the whole time, I really felt like I took it seriously as an opportunity and I didn't want to miss it out. And I had seen people come and go yeah. that partied too hard and broke shit in their hotel room and Sims would have to pay for it. And, and then at some point they weren't, their contracts weren't renewed. So right. I wasn't going to let anything get in the way of me snowboarding all the time. So when you move to Utah, that's a power move for a competitive snowboarder at that time. Yeah. And that house is legendary. You had yeah. so, like, is that where um, Palmer's band played? And there's all those, uh, those, oh, no, the Beastie Boys played That's there. Tahoe. Oh, that was Tahoe. That for... was Tahoe. Yeah. So the Kemper team had a photo shoot at Snowbird for five days. Yeah. And we just nailed the weather. Sick. We had powder every day. It was so sick. And everybody vowed to move to Utah after that. And so I went out there. Um, we I was dating Andy Hetzel at the time, and we got a condo, rented a condo. And then some of the other teammates got a house. And Utah was such uh, an undiscovered spot back in the early 90s. This is like 91. Oh, wow. And so it was so easy to get photos and cover photos the snow was flying everywhere and the snow was insane and you know we were at the right place at the right time with the right crew and photographers and we were getting photos that the magazines could not not publish right like they were just beautiful photography and it was easy to get because we were kind of the only startup crew along with locals and some people that had been there but that really exposed utah and then we watch the people start coming in <laughs> yeah. and the people start moving there and the film crews start basing out of there. And, yeah. and it really opened up a whole scene for the nineties. And I stayed there the whole nineties. I moved there for a winter and didn't leave till 1999. Wow. Yeah. I broke my leg in 99 and then decided to come back home. Fib tib or fib tib uh, in my ankle. Oh man. Yeah. That's and gnarly. I've got, you know, I went through some injuries in my career, but I, I'm so thankful that I got out alive. Like not everybody was so lucky. There was some bad injuries. There was death. There was uh, some pretty um, risky 
places that we were putting ourselves in by yeah. flying around helicopters in Alaska and things like that. And I look back on it now as a mom and I'm like, what was I thinking? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Would you <laughs> let your daughter moment, do that right now? Yeah. In the moment, like I was so in the moment with little responsibility outside of myself and I loved snowboarding and powder was the best. So we were charging it. And so, um, it's a different mindset once you're out of it. So I, not until I broke my leg in 99, did I get jolted right out of that mindset that I was a superwoman. Yeah. And then I felt break, I felt breakable. Yeah. And so I never got it back completely. I did heal my leg. The doctor said I was okay to snowboard and my mind wasn't quite ready. And I did go back to compete at the worlds in Van, um, at black home Whistler. Uh, they had the world championships that Sims put on. Yeah. I think it was in 2000 or 2001. Yeah. And I did go back and compete at that. I got second place. Wow. And then as I was taking off my bindings at that contest, I just said, that's it. I'm not going to compete anymore. I want to take care of my body. I need to land in powder. <laughs> I need to make my own choices, not ride on the day of the X games or the contest scheduled. If I'm not feeling it, you have pressure to still perform. So yeah, I made a conscious choice to kind of, uh, give myself a, my body a break. That's amazing. I mean, wear and tear for yeah, <laughs> 15 yeah. years. Yeah. It kind of starts to catch up with you a little bit. It's amazing. You went on on top, right? Like when you think yeah. about the progression of women snowboarding, like, Craig fell off when Terrier came out, right? Like mm -hmm. he brought up his, the guy who's going to overtake him, yeah. right? That's when he left to go to the back country. He's like, eh, competitions, you yeah. know, they were pretty serious there for a bit. But like you made it through that era and then like the fat pants jibbing era <laughs> and then like the X Games. Now they're building like the biggest jumps that have ever, ever. been built. Ever. I mean, yeah. my winning the 1998 X Games Big Air with my 720. Yes. I had no idea I was going to be able to pull that off. And the only practice I had had doing 720s, um, it started out in the backcountry. I started doing kind of McTwists off kind of side hits and I would over rotate, but I'd land in powder and ha 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 and get a good photo and whatever. Yeah. And so I was up at Mount Hood with Mark Frank and some of the Sims teams at the time. Oh, sick. And I was practicing over rotating my 360 spin and um, I was almost double rotating. And so I was like, well, maybe I'll just go for the double rotating because it's going to be easier than landing backwards in this slush. Yeah. So I was just going to spin twice instead of spinning for a 540. So um, Marco um, hung with me up there to kind of help me figure it out. Love that we spent guy. a whole day on this one jump that nobody wanted to jump because everybody was, the pipe had just got cut. And so everybody was down at the pipe. So it was just him and I, and we hiked it. And so I was black and blue on my legs from crashing and hitting my thighs into my high backs. Like it was, um, I got banged up trying to figure out that how that felt to over rotate like that. Yeah. And so when I showed up at the X games, I had only tried it once before at the contest that had been in Aspen just a month before. Yeah. And I had got it around and dragged out the landing and won and so I kind of knew that I had it in me, but this jump at the X Games was huge. <laughs> and so it's just such a crazy time because back then we had to do our trick that we were the least familiar with to win. And we had to do it on a jump that was bigger than we'd ever done it on and then try and pull it off. So it was just, I was so nervous and a little bit confident, but a little bit nervous. And I was super pumped about trying a new trick because I knew that would be recognized. Yeah. So the fact that I kind of squeaked out the landing okay and yeah. won that um, was a big deal. I remember riding up on the snowmobile because they were giving us shuttle runs at that time. And I was holding on to the guy going up and I saw all the people cheering for me like, oh. yeah, you did it. And I was like, okay, that was my moment. Yeah. That's like Tony's 900 or yeah. something. Like it's like yeah. you're at the X Games. You pull out this trick that's never been, never won a X Games before. Yeah, no woman had done that um, before on the platform like that. And so it did push women's snowboarding forward because we were kind of at that time 
There was lots of 360s. There was a couple backflips mm -hmm. and a couple kind of maybe a couple frontside 540s, but that was it. And a lot of the video parts of women, they were all the same tricks. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it did help push forward um, where women were now going to have to step up to Absolutely. beat a 720. So yeah, yeah. it definitely progressed the yeah, women. You're bringing me memories of seeing Spencer O'Brien. You know, I think she... She pulled a 900. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like, so awesome. Yeah. And like styly too. Like yeah. it's like women's progression there for about five years was like the most interesting part of the sport. Yeah. And I, I see, you know, cause I'm in a, in a very male centric friend group like when we're watching natural selection and guys go, Oh, the girls, it's just, hmm. it's hard to watch. I'm like, it's inspiring to watch because if I was a girl, my daughter or any girl snowboarder out there that's hungry sees that and thinks like this is attainable like yeah. i i live in jackson i could do a backflip i can do a five into powder yeah. and i could do a nose butter like you could go out there and win natural selection and push the sport it's yeah. like it's right there whereas if like a guy like me i'm watching travis rice do a video game run in Alaska, <laughs> it doesn't seem real. <laughs> it, it doesn't. It's definitely not attainable. Like I'll go out and do yeah. some power turns and be like, "Yay, my yeah. natural selection run!" But like, it's. I yeah. I think it ping pongs back and forth from like obviously the progression is dangerous. That's the yeah. thing about the sport. Yeah, it's a little scary to watch how high they're going in the half pipe and how big they're going in the backcountry, and mm -hmm. there is so much risk there. Um, but you have to remember that those in a day in the day the current time like those riders are building up to that yeah and they are more comfortable on their snowboard probably than walking in the lodge yeah like they are on it and they are in their mindset and they're pushing it the ones that aren't you don't see on the tv confession wise like i didn't watch women snowboarding mm -hmm. like i was one of those misogynist dudes in a shop going uh, yeah. The, why are why are they bothering? Like I honestly yeah. felt that. Like I'm like, well, if they're not doing better tricks than the guys, why do they get to be? And in the you were viewing magazines? it wrong because I, totally I was. was doing it because I love snowboarding. Yes, and isn't that a blessing? That and also my daughter wants to see herself reflected in the media. Mm -hmm. yeah. She's not going to get pumped seeing Travis Rice doing a video game run. Yeah. She's and I, I mean, it's just like parenting, like you said, a good example. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I got to be that example for so many women. And I still get messages on social media and stuff of, of women who said, I saw you in the magazines. I saw you at the X games. I saw you do it. I, that's how I started snowboarding. That's why I started snowboarding. Or yeah. That's yeah. why I strive to be better. And so having, um, that feedback continuing from people from way back in the day it just is so rewarding to know that even though i was following my passion it really did reflect on others in a positive way and give them exposure to snowboarding what a beautiful sport totally yeah i feel embarrassed like i progressed as a human being thankfully yeah. i spoke with jess camira uh -huh. who she just was like, I can't believe you thought any of that media was for you. Yeah, You know what I mean? Like it was, I, I, there was just a moment where I was like, oh my God, I'm a father of a daughter. Yeah, And I've been telling her, I literally said in the car one day, like, oh, women's bodies are just different or whatever. That stupid thing <laughs> that it's like, I didn't realize that the support, not having the support base means uh, you don't have the incentives. So you don't, yeah. It doesn't progress as as far yeah. or as fast, right? It's yeah. it's just a support thing. Yeah. I, I actually realized it when we were talking about football because men's football in Canada and the US, the Canadians are way behind. They don't get paid as much uh -huh. and they're not as athletic. They they have to work day jobs in the in to the, be on the football team. <laughs> yeah, in the winter, right? Yeah. Like it pays thirty grand a year to be a regular guy uh -huh. in the Canadian football league. So I put it to Chris Rasman. I said, is there something about Canadians that make them worse? Like, are our bodies huh. different or is there some sort of thing? He's like, no, I'm like, it's support. 
Yeah. If you take away the support, if you don't give the support, you don't get the progression. Yeah. And I wouldn't have been able to be a pro snowboarder for 20 years had I not had the support. Right. I mean, I had full 100% support from my parents to follow my dreams. Rad. I feel very lucky. They were driving us to contests back in the day and, you know, very supportive. And I felt supported by my peers on my teams, especially the Kemper team was such a wonderful start to my professional career and the Sims team that I was on. Like, I never felt unsupported. I just felt like I was um, in some situations where they didn't understand that I had the ability to do what the guys were doing. Yeah. And so I had to prove myself. And I have no problem proving myself. Yeah. And I'll go higher than I would have gone before. Obviously. <laughs> you know, like I feel like that kind of stepped it up because I had to make my mark and show my my ability to be to make sure there was a big error in the X Games the following year. Yeah, exactly. You know, there was a time when um the first big air contest, I think it was nineteen ninety six at the X Games and twenty women were invited. And the jump was super sketchy and only four of us showed up to practice. And we, at that time, recognized, like, if we don't do this, they're not even going to give us a chance to do it next year. So we showed up and did it. I got third place and it's kind of banged up, but we did yeah, it and yeah. pushed it on. And so moments like that really showed the industry and the ESPN and the X Games and all of those people filming us and showcasing us that we weren't going to let it go away. That's really good. Yeah. You wrote a book, Pretty yeah. Good for a Girl, right? That yeah. was what it was called. Because that was definitely that was something that was said all the time. All the time. Yeah. And I would come ripping down the hill with my, you know, I always made sure my ponytail <laughs> right. was flying out the back so they knew I was a girl. Yeah. yeah. And so often I would come down and take off my goggles and kind of <laughs> resituate before getting on the lift. And I would always get that, whoa, you're a girl. You're pretty good for a girl. Right. And so, you know, you can either take that as an insult or you can take it as a motivator and push on. So I was like, thought that was good. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. To be in the spotlight for that long, like, there, there are very few competitors that c compete for that long. Well, it was interesting because I started snowboarding when I was 16. Yeah. So I was winning contests as a teenager. I was winning contests in my 20s. And there was no other, you know, there was no equipment for seven-year-olds. So I wasn't going to get beat out by a 12-year-old right, girl. Right, right. And in the men... Sean White was yep. that 12 year old that was starting to step up to That's the 25 right. year old's right. ability and competition. So for me, um, women also just have a longevity power and pushing on. And um, I wasn't going to step down right. and let somebody take over. I still wanted it. Yeah. So as long as that drive was there, I was continuing to get exposure, which made my sponsors happy, which made my contracts renewing and, and kept flowing forward. And, um, the first girl that kind of stepped up youngster was Jenna Mayan. I remember. And she, she hit the scene. I think she was 13 and she was rad. And I was like, okay, there's the next group coming in. That's she's representing that next kind of generation that's coming up. Absolutely. Yeah. Kara Beth, Tara yeah. Dakitas. Like yep. that was, that was some pretty intense times in yeah. women's snowboarding. Again, it's happening in men's as well. Like I remember watching the jumps just get so big that it was like, this is insane now. Yeah. Like someone's going to get badly hurt and people yeah. did. Yeah. I think the jumps got too big because the people that were, the media was like, okay, well, it was this big last What's year. Next? We got to go bigger. Yeah. And it just got to the point where it was like, okay, that's as big as you could possibly do yeah. it. I hope that the progression of snowboarding has a lot to do with the riders mm -hmm. and not just the pressure on the riders. Yeah. And there's a difference because if the riders speak up that the jumps are too big and they actually make the change, then it's a cooperative progression. If they say, oh, then don't, then, you know, then just bail out, don't compete. If the jumps are too big, then somebody's going to step in that's on the waiting list that wasn't going to be in the contest anyways, they'll jump anything to be 
in the competition. So yeah. in the spotlight, get yep. a chance on TV, get a chance to be sponsored, get it, you know. Totally. So it's, um, I hope that it can move forward in a safe, safe way. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the whole industry at this point, and look, I'm not an expert in this. I can't possibly watch all the videos because yeah. there's so many, but it seems like f we're selling fun, right? Yeah. So like, there's a lot more fun and a lot less like Olympic contest footage. Yeah. It's like, and it also shifted. Like we would go on a photo shoot. We would take a bunch of pictures the filmer would wait until he had at least 15 rolls of film before he'd turn it in to get processed. Yeah. It'd be two weeks later before he'd get the slides back. And then we'd go over to his house to check out the slides to see if we got anything. Yeah. And it came down to me getting the grab, getting the trick. And it came down to the photographer having the right exposure, having the cool angle and getting the shot. And, and then it would get turned into the magazine in binders and binders and binders. Like they would use, you know, little carrying carts to get them into the magazine. Yeah. And then they'd sit there with the eye thing and go through all of them and select. And so it was a long process before that moment where it did come together actually came out in the magazine. And so now it's all day of like, yeah, I saw you know, JP and it's exposed and to whoever yesterday. wants yeah, to yeah. subscribe or follow yeah. or whatever. And so it's, um, almost like journaling or diaries and, and day by day where you're almost in the moment with those people, because, which I think is a cool thing for kids because they're like, Oh no way. I was at Boreal that day. Right. Or I was there yesterday. I didn't see him or, yeah. you know, like they're, they're kind of a part of it more because, and because it's not costing, you know, thousands of dollars to print magazines, they have room for the fun yeah. to be part of it. Yeah. It's not a, snowboard movie that has to be 60 minutes and you know even though i filmed with them all year i didn't even make the movie right like stuff like that happened yeah because there was only so many minutes to give now it's the internet i think you could post you know yeah videos once a week if you wanted to however long you wanted and keep an audience going and share your livelihood and your abilities and the snowboarding i miss the old days because we all shared a common visual language right like i know the picture of you with the ponytail everybody from our generation yeah. knows that picture like we shared these moments that you know okay seeing how the sausage is made you know <laughs> that it was guy motel and kevin kinnear post holing through the snow just trying to make ends meet and stretching all these photos over five issues so like you're not getting what's going on in snowboarding you're getting yeah. a couple of events that's kind of, you know, looking back is like, oh, but, you know, like brushy tweaking, you know, like everybody in the industry saw that photo and was like, and, that that's amazing. Yeah. Now we don't share a magazine. There is no, I mean, there's, and there's no now. trade shows and nothing, you know, the, the ASR show where all the movie premieres were and right. we all gathered. And so it is a little bit disconnected. And it's, I mean, I always thought like, oh, one of these days, you know, I kind of stopped snowboarding. I focused on my family and I had my daughter and I thought, oh, I'll have to, you know, swing back through and say hi to everybody and show up to one of these events. And now those events don't even happen anymore. You know, the magazine offices aren't there to swing by. So there's kind of a disconnect where it kind of the abyss of it just expanded to where it's just everywhere. And every, you know, it, it would be a harder effort to to get out there and try and connect totally but yeah and, and there's this shuffling in of all these things so now when you're yeah. looking at your snowboard media if you're like me and you're looking at it on social media then you're going to see a cat video and a kid falling down a bear attack somebody <laughs> on a mountain bike doing something insane a, a red bull stunt four oh. ads for like you know health products <laughs> and then like the coolest clip you've ever seen in snowboarding yeah. But then if you're talking with your buddy about it, like, oh, did you see that clip? It's like, no. It's like we were so happy to have Trans World because before that it was like clips and thrash or, or like... Yeah, or little like tidbits. tidbits. And ISM and was magazine. around. ISM, right. I didn't yeah. get ISM because I was too remote. Oh, okay. But it was like 
Action Now or whatever, or BMX Plus would do like, oh, snowboarding's coming. Yeah. And to have your own magazine of all the snowboarding stuff going on was just, it was incredible. I remember recording stuff off the TV, like, oh, they showed snowboarding on TV <laughs> and having a tape of like yeah. 10 different clips from yeah. the television. And yeah. now it's just like. It's almost like you can choose what you want to see. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the whole point of it, right? Yeah. So, so um, it, I don't know enough about the current sponsorship world and how people are coming up these days and getting recognized, but um, you just have to get in front of the right audience. Social media is a big it's factor. It's a big factor. Team managers are like managing people's yeah. posting. Like, I'm sure the contracts yeah. of today are way different than my $250 a month. <laughs> And you're obligated to go to two photo shoots for the team wow. and you can turn in receipts for expenses. We'll pay for your entry fees. And then if I got, I had a sliding scale. If I got first place, I got a bonus. If I got second place at a contest, I get a certain bonus. And then if I got a full page in the magazine that showed the product and I got a bonus. And so now I'm sure that the contracts are like, you have to post this many posts yeah. and tag the product and hashtag yeah. this and you know i'm but sure there's some pretty detailed more, instructions i'm seeing a lot more like the boot i'm wearing is the this yeah. you know in a in a post from a guy and you're like i don't know how i feel about that yeah. i mean it's you're doing your job yeah hey but, if he gets a snowboarder every day and that's what he has yes. to do he has no complaints <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely. how i felt i was like tell me what i have to do to snowboard every day how can I make this work? And it was getting sponsored head to toe yeah. so that I could pay my bills of having a car and food and, you know, living and things like that. And when I added up my goggle sponsor and my outerwear sponsor and my boot sponsor and my board sponsor, I did, I had it covered. That's amazing. So that's, that made it work. Did you do your own accounting? Like, did you pay your own taxes and all that? Yeah. Or did you? Yeah. That Back then it was, it was simpler <laughs> life. <laughs> yeah, totally. So yeah. when did you settle down and have kids? Did you do that during your com- competitive career? No. In 1999, I broke my leg and that kind of stopped my competitive snowboarding And then I went on to do some commentating for NBC a little bit. I also did um, the GKA uh, TV show on Fuel Network. Okay. um, That was an all-girls action sports thing that I hosted. Rad. So I got to do that and travel around and be involved. And that I wrote my book that came out in 2003 And then I uh, met my husband and had my daughter uh, in 2007. So she was born. She's my only child. And I was ready to be 100% focused on raising her, um, being completely present. And so I um, knew that I wasn't going to be able to be a snowboarder or even a commentator and leave, you know, and travel like that. So I kind of let let that chapter of my life um, be done. And I focused on um, home life. And so I opened um, a retail gift store um, because I like to create and do art and crafts and things. And so I started doing that, which turned into a wholesale business. And I still to this day have my gift wholesale line. It's called My Favorite Things. And so I still uh, run that. And then um, with Addison, her diagnosis for scoliosis came when she was 10 years old, um, five years ago. And so that really shifted for me, um, just the power of being a parent and, and being a strong, um, having strength in that time and then seeing how strong Addison was and how she stepped up without complaint to take on this condition. And so she's just been so inspiring to me pushing through. It's been a, a, a hard road, but a, a doable, achievable road. And I'm thankful every day that it's just scoliosis. Like that's where my mind was. I was like, could be worse. Um, we'll take this and we'll make the best of it and work through, um, and make sure she's out of pain and, and can function and not give up dance classes and not give up things that she loves to do. And so, my artwork, my mixed media artwork really blossomed during that time when I saw her spine 
on the MRI, I realized that I had to incorporate that in art just to process it. And so I started doing mixed media collage and I really, really love, um, that part of my art life is a good part of my life now. Have you integrated that into snowboarding? Like have, have companies come and said like, we yeah. want to put Tina art on yeah. our stuff? Um, I was really fortunate to pair up with the Capita snowboarding and do a series, a limited series of art boards, pro models yeah. in 2021. <laughs> I had to think about it for a second in 2021 because we had the idea of doing it earlier and then COVID kind of took over for a minute there. So we delayed yeah. the project. So um, they did a release of the boards and I was just so pleased with the graphics and had lots of feedback and kind of, it kind of helped reconnect me with the snowboarding world a little bit. And I got to do the bomb hole podcast and see yeah. Eastone and Chris and those guys. And um, so I feel like there's a little more energy and snowboarding for me now. And Addison's grown and is a teenager, which is when I discovered snowboarding. And so she's kind of got the bug of excitement and is on her team at her high school. And so, so fun, so thrilling to go snowboarding with her. So the fact that it's raining and today means it's snowing up in the mountains. So Amazing. can't wait to get on the mountain with her. And it's, it's kind of just comes around full circle where you see an Addison um, she's like, I know Jamie Anderson. I said, well, you met her at the boarding for breast cancer <laughs> event at Sierra. And she said, my friends were talking about her the other day. I didn't know I knew her. And I showed her a picture of, you know, when she was like this high with Jamie. And so she, um, I just recognize how she looks up and sees those girls as heroes. And she knows mom is a snowboarder, but I'm mom. Yeah. Um, but yeah. she does see old footage I share with her of the X games and old footage. And she's like, Whoa, mom, that's you. That's like, rad. wow. You know, so it's fun to share, share my story with her as well. It's such a tough thing with kids. Hey, because the relationship is you really, I mean, I, I can't speak for you, but like for me, I'm dad, right? Like, it's yeah. like, dad, can I borrow the car? Dad, can I, you know, yeah, yeah, and I'm that's like, hey, my I'm role. Doing this, like, I'm doing the show, <laughs> and I, I got to talk to Terry, and they're like, well, oh, big deal. But <laughs> I sometimes catch them. My daughter, especially, will tell her friends, she'll, she'll say, I got a listener for the show. He yeah. subscribed to the show, and it's so sweet to connect with your kids on that level. Yeah. Like, that's just joy in my heart when my daughter's like, Can I borrow the car and go snowboarding with my friends? I'm yeah. like, not with me. She's like, no, I'm going with my friends. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God, she really. She's in that moment she, and we know it. it. Yeah. We know what that feels like. And even though that was a million moons ago, yeah, we still remember that feeling. And it's just the pure stoke of, of being in that moment. And, you know, Addison's starting to link turns and get, you know, she's at the beginning of it and she's so hyped on it and came off the mountain the other day, like, oh my gosh, I rode over the box and didn't fall. And, you know, like, Amazing. it's so rewarding. It's just, uh, that's really what life's about. Yeah. Dave and I were talking about old men. He was golfing with <laughs> old men yesterday, 88 that are probably guy. our age. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> I was remembering, um, at Mount Hood, Timberline's got a chairlift called Storm and Norman. It's actually okay. named after a lifty who oh, was no a lifty way. there. I'm not sure when. Huh. I don't even want to guess, but we rode up the chairlift with Storm and Norman. Oh, no way. And he was in his 90s. Oh, wow. And he was just spraying knowledge. He's like, you know, the life of a skier is a blessed life. Yeah. Like, I feel sorry for people that don't connect with nature the way that we connect with nature yeah. and he kind of looked he goes oh, i think snowboarders too <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome but yeah. it's like the, it I, is all about connecting with nature i a, totally 100 percent believe that i think that's what kids need more than anything in these times is to connect with nature and be out i made a wish on january 1st of this year to be awe struck by nature i wanted to put myself in situations where I was in awe of nature and I succeeded. I saw some amazing sunsets and rainbows rad, rad. and forest and spider webs that blew me away and mushrooms blooming in my forest that were a miracle of life when you really learn about stuff like that. And so I um, 
I want to have my head in the clouds most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of mushrooms and this might, you know, we can cut this out if it's not appropriate, but yeah. did you ever like try mushrooms for like post-traumatic stress after breaking your no. legs or anything like that? No, I, um, I have never done any drugs. Are you serious? I'm serious. The, the only thing I <laughs> it was just like wasted. <laughs> the but, only yeah. thing I've ever tried was I tried a, a little nibble of a pot cookie once. Yeah. It's like this big and all it did was made my upper lip turn up. <laughs> I was just like this all night. You so dated I've never... Adam Yauch, the Beastie No, I didn't Boys. date Adam Yauch. No. He was my roommate. He was your roommate? No. Okay. Yeah, he was my roommate. So and he, he never did. I didn't know him to do drugs. No, oh, wow. You know, like our scene, um, I think people knew that that's how I was, that I wasn't going to partake. Right. And so they didn't, ex like maybe they'd leave the room. Right. Like I don't even remember being around drugs all the time or anything but i remember a bunch of wasted snowboarders yeah, often yeah 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 but and you um, were the designated driver slash yeah you know yeah like i felt crew, i right. felt um like snowboarding gave me the high of life i didn't feel like i had to take it any further that's and, cool and i would be at trade shows and things where i didn't have to snowboard the next day for any reason or you know at a conference and i'd have some cosmopolitans and kick back but that's <laughs> yeah, all i needed yeah. i never felt like i needed more than that and um my i told my daughter like i've never you know i want to teach you about drugs so that you know everything you need to know about it for safety yeah um i don't have any experience with it i've never done any real drugs like that before um and she was like really and then her like a couple of her friends came over and they're like, mom, tell them what you told yeah, me. Yeah. And I said, you mean that I've never done drugs? And they're like, what? <laughs> right. Right. Like, it's surprising. It kind of made me sad that it was so surprising that somebody could live their life and not have to have some substance to help them along the way. So I just had a clear vision of, of, of what I wanted and I didn't need any of that to help me get there. Well, it speaks to, I remember someone turning to me in grade 10 and saying, you know, are you on drugs right now? I'm like, I've never tried drugs. And they were like, yeah, right. Yeah. And there was something in me at that moment that changed where I was like, if society's looking at me because I'm a snowboarder as mm -hmm. this person who's doing drugs, you know, I may as well be doing it. If I'm getting in trouble for it anyways, I may as well <laughs> be doing it. And I went hard. Like, yeah. I, yeah, like crazy amounts of drug use over the years but that was because i didn't have that focus to compete like i would yeah. go to the to the contest and see how hard people were partying and, and that they could do it and then i would party that hard but i could not get up in the morning and yeah. go to a contest yeah. i'd be like are you kidding me that's crazy yeah it just never didn't felt the need it, yeah, or yeah. never felt the longing to to right to be in that moment like that yeah and i think a little bit of it is um I didn't want to be um, um, not in control of myself. That right, makes sense. For safety. And, you know, everybody else can go nuts. You know, I'll drag you into the minivan later, but <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. not going to be in the ditch with you. <laughs> well, yeah, and, you've, and you've seen people literally in the ditch. Yeah. So you're going like, I don't see the. It just wasn't attractive appeal. to me. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't attractive to me. I just see the mushrooms in your paintings. Yeah, and, like, and I it, I it, it have looks... this property in the forest yeah. um, on the coast, and I have never gone mushroom picking or anything. I love to eat mushrooms in my food and yeah. buy them at the grocery store all the time. Never knew much about them. And so this new land that I have, I went up there, and I was with my dad, and we were working on the land, and we were getting ready to leave. And I said, hey, I just want to run into the forest into the deep part of the forest and just see if there's any mushrooms yeah. blooming. I, f I feel like this is the time of year when it's happening. And I was gone for like an hour and my dad's hollering for me and whistling, like, are you alive? Like, yeah. you know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, the mushrooms, <laughs> like you've got to come back and see this. And there was like 15 different types of mushrooms or bright red ones. There's little 200 of the same one all in one patch. And then they were blooming out the sides of logs and had rainbows on them and some of them were see-through and so i mind blown like yeah. i was yeah they're gorgeous in the forest in nature by myself in awe of nature just so happy 
to be in awe of nature. And I've learned since how important mushrooms are to us and to the earth and that their decomposed death brings life. And it just seems like that's part of life. And so it really, I really connected with these blooming mushrooms in that moment. And so I knew that they were going to come into my artwork. So I was taking pictures with my phone. And so my artwork has some of these mushrooms. And since I did share on social media about this mushroom experience, and I didn't touch any of the mushrooms because I was freaked <laughs> yeah, out, yeah. like even touching them. Of course. And sure enough, some of them were psychedelic mushrooms yeah, and yeah. I didn't know which one. I knew nothing. <laughs> so they're like, I hope you didn't eat those. And I'm like, I kind of wanted to pick them all and make a taco. And they were like, no. Oh yeah, there's some dead <laughs> so mushrooms there's, you out know, there And too. it just shows again how powerful <clears throat> Mother Nature is and how um, it all works with us if we respect it. And so... For me, um, I just go back to nature to 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 for the blueprint plan. <laughs> yeah, the connectivity. <laughs> the connectivity it's, it's is there. Right. It's really uh, real to me, and I um, I'm after it now. I'm kind of like recognize how much energy it gives me. I recognize how meaningful it is to me for my health, for mindset, for taken a break from this busy, crazy world that seems to be spinning off orbit. And so going out and being in completely submerged in nature and, and accepting that is uh, kind of my practice now. <laughs> That's epic. That's so epic. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm surprised that like the imagery in your paintings with the mushrooms, I mean, it looks like someone on mushrooms. <laughs> I know. So it's, I mean, when you look at it, like that mushroom that she's holding is a psychedelic mushroom. It is, and the spore print. So that's print, what didn't know got, it when I took the photo of it. Spore print there, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, and she has mushrooms coming out of her head. The, yeah. I think those are the trumpet mushrooms, the purple ones. Uh -huh. And so for somebody who's never done mushrooms, my mind was blown by mushrooms yeah. in a different way than some people use mushrooms and eat them and have their mind blown. Like my mind was blown just by yeah. finding them. It was like an adult Easter egg hunt. Yeah. And I was so high on the excitement of it that I was literally running through the forest by myself in glee, screaming amazing. with joy, <laughs> <sighs> like, oh yeah. my gosh. Like you were high. That's yeah, amazing. It was, it was amazing. And for me, that's all I need. I don't know if I'll ever eat a mushroom, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's uh, nature's nature has some powers. That's for sure. Well, I think that you're speaking right now to, to something that. I've spoken a lot about psychedelics on the on the show, oh. and my relationship to psychedelics has matured in the last two years, especially. And I don't think they're for everyone. And at one yeah. point, I was like, you know, get John Roth's microdoses. Everybody yeah, I should do this. Watched that show yeah, with yeah, him yeah, and yeah. and saw yeah. how powerful it meant to him and healing. And I can see how nature has given us this gift. If Absolutely. we use it wisely, there is some healing to be done with that. And and if mushrooms can rewire your brain to a different perspective that can change your life and how you view it, yeah. and all you needed was a jolt to get out of the the rut or the path that you were on that you could not get out of, I mean, that's a positive thing. So it's it's part of it, it looks like a poisonous thing to me, and then mm -hmm. part of it can be a healing thing. And so I'm, I'm in between because I don't know that. Right. So I'm learning and trying to keep open to, to why nature brings us these things and what are we supposed to do with them? I think it's really important to point out that you have had an experience that's very much, if not adjacent to uh, identical to taking mushrooms and going into a forest. So, like, if somebody's out there and they've heard me say, oh, you should do mushrooms, try mushrooms, whatever. Like, no, if you're afraid of mushrooms, don't do them. Yeah. That's really important because it'll just exacerbate that fear. But if you want that feeling, literally go into a forest and during mushroom season and rejoice in the beauty of yeah. mushrooms. Yeah. It's probably the same brain plasticity you're probably Something having the, chemically a, happening to a, a very I mean, it similar comes down to like yes when you're a seven-year-old and you see the news and a building falls over on the news or there's violence yes 
that child's brain thinks that it happened. Mm -hmm. And so there's danger and damage that can be done by this exposure when you're young because your brain doesn't know the difference. And there's still things as an adult with a matured brain that um, your brain has reactions and can you still have that like you can oh, see yeah. you know it's the fight or flight like if, yeah you know if you get scared or your your brain is goes on defense or you know things like that and so when people say like oh my gosh you have to go on mushrooms you're gonna have mm. the time of your mm. life or you're gonna have mm -hmm. this new perspective like you're really putting a lot of pressure on that substance to do yeah. something for this person and what if they're not open or what if they're not ready or ready totally. what if their body is going to have a bad reaction or mm -hmm. what if there it opens up wounds and trauma from past that is now open and can't be shelved anymore you know like there's some dangers to depending 100%. on a substance to do something that it did for you and think that it's just going to exactly do the same thing for everybody else so it's not that's going a to. risky thing that's, yeah so like i spent a year or two kind of prothelitizing is that even a word of know. just <laughs> of just saying listen if you're in a rut and this is everybody if you're yeah. anxious if you have like a low level like fear of the world microdose you'll yeah, love yeah. it and a lot of people came back and said i just don't get it not even i don't get it just it just doesn't work for me and i go Oh my God, it's not supposed to work for everybody. For everybody. It's, it's actually. And for me, like if yeah. I needed something to ease pain or, you mm -hmm. know, people that are dealing with cancer and people yes. that are dealing with stuff, like I'd much rather turn to nature mm -hmm. than turn to a chemical yes. thing. 100%. Of so, course. We have to uh, promote that nature thing. Like I, yeah. it's, it's so cool that we talked about it because I haven't spoken to that person yet like to oh. you about like what the power of actually just getting in nature is yeah and some places around the world i think in the united states doctors are prescribing time in nature now instead of prescribing and, pills yeah well they should they it's just totally should. it's sad that they have to prescribe getting in nature because mm -hmm. we should already be in nature totally <laughs> we're just of like, nature oh yes. my gosh like we have to get off our screens and be part of this because it is part of us whether we want to be it to be or not and yes. i had this experience in colorado with my mom this year and we were in crestone colorado it's at like eight thousand feet it's in the one of the biggest mountain uh valleys in the world and the mountains are shooting up behind us and the clouds being at that elevation, the clouds are just coming across the valley and they're just coming right at you. It's not like the clouds in the sky. So I was really like, whoa, we're in this and the altitude and we're just kind of like dizzy and we're like, they're talking about this vortex that exists here and there's all these religious temples there and there's things happening there in enlightenment type energy. And so we were reading about it in the hotel magazines and we were hearing about it at the co-op with the 200 people that live there. And then we really experienced it and it was a real thing. And we had um, a rainbow appeared <clears throat> and we, I yelled to my mom, I said, get in the car. And she, she didn't even hesitate. She just started bolting to the car. We were at a painting class. <laughs> And I peeked out the window and saw the rainbow and she got in the car and we raced up the hill to the rainbow and we drove through somebody's property. <laughs> I don't even know whose property. And I slammed on the brakes and we got out and we were dancing in the rain, looking at the rainbow and it started to be a double rainbow. And we were just in awe, freaking out like, whoa, it was so joyous. And I'm standing there you know, dancing with my mom in somebody's backyard. <laughs> and so we're having this experience with the rainbow. And then we turned around and just saw the 30 miles of the flat mountain valley and the sun setting and the clouds. And it was just this, whoa, whoa, like just floored us both. And we both looked at each other and we just felt the same thing at the same time that we were all, we were a part of it and had an experience. And so when we, and then it was over and then it, the sunset and then it was gone. It was like three minutes. Wow. And so we went back to our hotel and we were talking about it. And we were like, 
what you feel like we were sharing our feelings about the, the experience. And it was interesting because what it brought up for both of us is that this highest that I've ever been with my mom, this high that we were feeling brought the feeling of death. And so it blew me away that that's what we both felt. And she felt like she was okay now because she knew that we would be able to connect with her when she, when it's her time to go. Wow! And so I said, I'm okay with it too. I felt that too. And if it's tomorrow, it's tomorrow. If it's in 10 years, 20 years, whatever it is, I feel like I'm, I know that too. And then for me, I felt like the only thing holding me back was my skin was the only thing holding me from bursting into the rainbow. Like that's what it felt like. And so I felt like I was going to just be absorbed into everything. And it wasn't just the heavens or the clouds and the rainbow. Like I was going to be absorbed into the dirt under my feet. Like it was everything. And so I really was like, okay, I get it. Like nature has this power and we are connected to it. And so if we ever feel disconnected from this world or disconnected from ourselves, like nature is the place to go. Like, I feel like I can reset at any time by getting out and connecting with, I mean, why wouldn't we be that connected to it? We're all here for, to share energy. Like, why wouldn't we also be sharing energy with nature? Yeah. If you're at work listening to this right now, go outside, no matter (laughs) where you are or what the thing is, go out. If it's night, look at the stars. If it's raining, just be in the rain. It's such an incredible, like you just described to me, like my most you know, powerful psychedelic experiences. That's how it feels. Yeah. You come out and you're not afraid of death because you know this is so special that we're here now. Yeah. And that we get to experience this. Well, I feel lucky that I was able to reach that with my mom in this natural way. Just unbelievable. Um, It's a moment that we will never forget for sure. It really, um, really was an experience for us. So special. Yeah. It's so hard being a parent and having had these amazing experiences in the in the mountains or like what you just described and then trying to inspire those moments with your kids because you can't manufacture that stuff. I feel like I have to just lead by example mm-hmm. and and I realize that the way I handle things, whether it's dealing with a, um, a conflict or, uh, opportunity, um, that I want to show my daughter that, that nothing will hold you back. Like, um, she sees me start a company. She sees me, you know, create art and sell it and have an art show. She sold her art. Like I'm trying to include her in my experiences so she can learn that she can do whatever her, she sets her heart to do, you know? Well, and there's the obvious with the scoliosis. It's like, that's hard to see. Like some of those posts, that is the challenge of parenting that you're just so afraid that something like this is going to happen. But it's also so inspiring because the connection between you and your daughter is palpable. It's like, that's real life. Yeah. And I feel like the scoliosis has been, it will be a part of her life for her whole life. Um, our goal is to just not have pain from it, which so far we are successful at. And I feel like this journey with it is, um, a lesson of delayed gratification to where if you work hard now, your adult self is going to be in better shape and that's years away. So like for a 10 year old to take on the daily treatment and, continue that without complaint is like a life lesson that you can't teach. She's living it. And she knows that hard work can lead to a result in the future. So the, the, the scary part is that the kids of today are so, I call them the push button generation. Like they're used to a quick response. Like they can barely wait for their Starbucks to get delivered. They have to order on the app and pick it up. So it's like, they are so used to information coming at them fast. It's instant. Um, it's 24 hours a day. And so they're, they're even just the way their brains are being wired, raised in that kind of environment. 
they need instant gratification. And so for Addison to learn this delayed gratification in such a big way, and it's more than like going out with your dad and building a tree fort that takes three weeks. Right. That's delayed gratification and working on something. But when it's um, Keep going, something so. like, yeah, did it go off? We can pause. I think that my phone is making a noise. It, it, it's oh. historic too. Like you're interviewing some people that have some stories to tell. You so feel you that, right? That. Like yeah. you feel that reverie for like the, yeah. the special space that you hold in the, yeah. in the culture. And we're not just talking just snowboarding. Like yeah. you said, you were in an, a Smithsonian ex- exhibit. Yeah, yeah. Like snowboarding holds this crazy spot in, in the world where the world transitioned from kind of stuffy, stuck up, you know, sports that were, when, when I think about seeing Olympic freestyle skiing and they're doing the flips off the big jumps, it was really impressive, but there, it was, it was robotic and calculated and it, there was no surf in it. There was no, what is that personality? It didn't have the kind of personality that, you know, Jamie Lynn doing a 360, Peter line doing off access stuff. Yeah. You know, it was just so visually stimulating and invigorating that we lived in this weird time where you could go to two or three contests and become like a cultural icon. Yeah. That's yeah. insane. It's awesome. It's um um I'm so thankful that um I was at the right place at the right time because I feel like the chapter that I had in snowboarding was perfect for me. I don't feel like I would be um thriving as a competitor today and and so um kind of strategically planned and mm-hmm. you know with you know it's kind of too structured for me Coaching and i'm an artist and, and i you know right, like i right. enjoyed that i was the misfit and that we were the <laughs> green-haired punk kids that showed up on a scene that didn't want us like yeah it was um an exciting time and i don't think i mean of course snowboarding will never have that beginning again so mm-hmm. the fact that i got to be at the beginning of the sport was a blessing it's i could, wouldn't trade it for anything that's so crazy i i do want to say thank you for you know, all that you did for snowboarding and for even myself in that, you know, that grumpy guy going, what is this all about? Like you come around and be like, I'm so glad that as a sport, we had strong women that like, I, you you mentioned Gaylene and I, I think she's someone I need to have on the show for sure. For sure. And the fact that she bankrolled Shannon's board. Yeah. That to me is like, I can't even believe that's a story that had to happen, Yeah, but that it did and that your group and also the advocacy for, look, we're, we're going to do something cool for the community. Like the boarding for breast cancer thing set the pace for, you know, the full moon girls and for women snowboarding to have like a higher purpose than just winning contests. Yeah. I mean, we recognize that in our snowboarding world of how our actions rippled out. And I think it's just a full lesson of life. Like our actions do affect other people. The way we live our life affects other people and the attitude we have towards others in their hard times and whatever. Like it is just, if we can have that, if we can lead like that, then, then it does ripple out in positivity. Yeah. And it's still 100%. We're still seeing the effects of it. Like you say, people still reach out and say, yeah, I've, started snowboarding because I saw you snowboarding. Yeah. And I feel that it was an honor and uh right place, right time that I was in that, in that scene when I, you know, I got to make my mark and, and be a little part of history. Yeah, definitely. Big part of snowboard history. <laughs> well, thanks for doing the show, Tina. Thanks Thank for you. I'm honored inviting to be me here. into your home. This is amazing. Awesome. Thank <laughs> you. Thanks. That was Awesome. awesome. F and Rad shoutouts this week to Tina, her husband Zach, and their daughter Addison. Thanks for inviting F and Rad into your wonderful home for this interview. Big shoutouts to listener Cam from Nutby Noboards. He had his latest split noboard featured on Pal Surf Journal's favorite boards list shortly after losing a very close friend. So it's been a big week for Cam. Love you, buddy. 
Also, my best friend from high school, Chris, just got AirPods, so he started listening to the show, and he sent me the nicest message today, so I'd like to shout him out, too. Thanks to all of you who make it to the end. You're the reason I do this. Be sure to come back next week for another episode of F and Rad Snowboarding, presented by Vans and brought to you by SIA Productions.